and welcome Hoosier fans to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important IU basketball stories from the past seven days. This is our 63rd edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 384th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, February 8th, 2018. I'm your host, Jared Morris, and let's begin this week how we begin every episode of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And for this week's banner moment, I want to take you back to the Rutgers game and to a relatively innocuous play that happened at about the nine-minute mark of the first half that is pretty easy to forget, pretty easy to overlook, but that I think really hints at something bigger. And it, at this time in the first half, Devontae Green curled off a little screen at the left elbow and received a pass. And at this point, Devontae had several options. He could have taken an off-balance shot, which we've seen him do many times. He could have forced a quick pass, which we've seen him do many times. Or he could have even attempted a challenging drive through traffic to try to reach the rim. All of these would have been less than optimal choices and choices, again, unfortunately, that we have seen Devontae make all too often. So what did he actually do? Well, he was patient. He took a second to read the defense, and he found a wide-open Jawan Morgan for three. Juwan drained it. Indiana went up 22 to six. And as you recall, the game was a route uh, even before that, but certainly from that point forward. And what I loved about this play is that it was a microcosm of the growth that we are seeing offensively in Devante over the past couple of weeks. He's playing more patiently. He's more under control and he's finding opportunities to create for his teammates without putting possessions at risk, which he was doing far too much of previously. And given the fact that Indiana is so thin on guys who can create offense, and given that there are only three guards projected to be on the 2018-19 roster at the moment, nothing is more important for the immediate and midterm future of the program than Devontae Green getting it and becoming a consistent force. Well, he just turned in the best three-game performance, the best three-game stretch of performances of his career and now the challenge is to keep the strong play going and raise Indiana's immediate and future ceiling in the process. All right, let me now introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. To my left, we don't yet have one of the world's most respected bracketologists and the longtime president of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, because Andy is not here yet due to his daughter's basketball practice, but fear not. He has promised that he will be joining us after his first segment, or after this first segment. So we'll look forward to Andy uh, getting on the show here momentarily. But to my right, we have a man who 98% of assembly call listeners would trust to make a technical free throw for IU over any player currently on the roster, which I suppose isn't really saying a whole lot. He's a columnist for the big lead, and he is someone who was nearly traded by his beloved Los Angeles Lakers to the Cleveland Cavaliers earlier Thursday in a deal that would have also sent Thomas Bryant to Cleveland in exchange for Kevin Love and Brian Windhorst, but... He refused to waive his no-trade clause because after living in the Midwest during and after college, he realized he's not mentally tough enough to handle any weather that isn't Southern California weather. He is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, what is your rant from the past week in Indiana basketball? I believe that makes me sane, actually. It's a sane human being. Uh, yeah, for choosing. I know I'm weird for choosing to live where it's warm. Um, but actually, I want to. I want to. I know this is Indiana basketball. Uh, radio oh show. But I want to say oh congratulations boy. to all of the newest Hoosiers who signed their letters of intent for football yesterday. Okay. Uh, congratulations on making the best decision of your life and good luck in the future. And welcome to the Hoosier, Hoosier Nation. Welcome to Hoosier, the Hoosier family. Uh, that's pretty great. It's always an awesome day when you bring in a bunch of new Hoosiers. Um, I would just say, I think my, I guess my rant this week, is I, I think that uh, it, it like you with Devonte Green, I think that with a couple guys on this roster, we're really seeing um, some guys play much better and much more, you know, within the system and, and and playing like a team as opposed to. I think for a long time this year, we saw these guys playing like five guys who had no idea what the other guys were doing. And I think that now we've kind of seen them all settle in to understanding what each other are going to do and what you know, uh, the coach wants them to do. And, and I think that that's the first step really. And I know it's late in the season to be having a first step. Trust me, I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, but it's the first step in seeing them grow as a long-term threat um, to, you know, you know, to the rest of the Big Ten and grow into something that 
resembles stability. So I think that I would say uh, that's certainly a positive. And I know, again, it was Rutgers, but you saw on both ends of the floor, you saw guys executing what they wanted to execute. I thought Indiana's defense was excellent in that game. Um, and, and I think that it's, again, you're just seeing progression. And that's right now what you want to see moving forward with this team and, and from Archie Miller. Absolutely. All right. Here's what we are going to discuss this week. We will talk about the ridiculous Michigan grad transfer rule of Big Ten champions. Uh, and then I want to ask Ryan about a challenge that Indiana might face in getting a grad transfer. Get his thoughts on that. We will talk about the upcoming schedule and what is possible if Indiana plays well down the stretch. Uh, and then we'll debut a new segment called Did You Realize? in which we relay some pretty remarkable statistics that might just blow your mind a little bit and challenge your current conceptions of this Indiana team. Uh, plus, we have some great listener questions and including two of the best tweets and emails that we've ever gotten that we have to relate to you at the end of the show. Uh, all of that coming here on Assembly Call Radio. Now, this quick reminder, the next time that you are looking for tickets to a sporting event or concert, remember our friends at SeatGeek. You can download their app, which is incredibly convenient and easy to use, or if you just want an easy-to-remember URL that will take you directly to the IU basketball ticket listings on SeatGeek's website, here it is iutickets.shop. Hopefully you have that URL memorized by now. I actually saw some purchases come in recently from a couple of random concerts, like an Elton John concert and a couple of other ones. So people are clearly using the URL to go to SeatGeek and then making purchases, which is awesome because when you do that, you help support the show because we get a little cut. Uh, we get a little commission whenever you make a purchase using that URL. So it's very helpful. Uh, but speaking specifically about Indiana games, if you want tickets to any upcoming Indiana game, including the two home games coming up against Minnesota and Illinois, or any of the other games, the Big Ten Tournament, SeatGeek has you covered and at the best price that you will find anywhere. Check out the latest ticket deals on the SeatGeek app, or you can use the URL iutickets.shop. And if it's your first time using SeatGeek, don't forget the promo code ASSEMBLY. Use it when you make your first purchase, and you will get $20 back after that purchase. Again, the promo code ASSEMBLY, A-S-S-E-M-B-L-Y. All right, you are listening to the Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips. We are hoping to be joined by Andy Bottoms soon enough. But Ryan, let's move forward. And, you know, there's this kind of crazy thing that's happened now two years in a row. And it was kind of funny. You know, Max Bielfeld transfers from Michigan to Indiana and Indiana wins the Big Ten Championship. Max, of course, came as a graduate transfer. And I think we all agree that without him, there's no chance that that team wins the Big Ten like they did. He was a huge part of it. Last year, Spike Albrecht is a grad transfer to Purdue from Michigan. Purdue wins the Big Ten. And now this year, I guess just to maybe like up the difficulty level, Andrew Dockich transfers from Michigan as a grad transfer to Ohio State, a team picked to finish 11th, 12th, 13th in the conference. And they are now in first place in the Big Ten conference after beating Purdue last night in Mackey. Uh what do you have to say here about the the this Michigan grad transfer rule? And by the way, I looked. I don't think they have anyone eligible. Duncan Robinson has only played three years at Division One. He was at Division Three Williams College. So I don't know if he can graduate and then if he would have another year of eligibility. I'm not exactly sure how that works. But if so, get him to Bloomington and you're guaranteed to get a Big Ten championship. Uh, first, I, I, I'm going to say something I've never said in my entire life after watching that Ohio State-Purdue game. Go Buckeyes. It's the only, <laughs> you will never catch me saying that again. If somebody wants to cut that out and replay it anytime they hear me talk, fine. But you will never hear me repeat that. Um, what I'll say is I, I think that it's funny because the, the players who come out of there are not lauded for their playing ability. Max Bielfeld made himself way better. Uh, Andrew Dockage is certainly affecting games and Spike Albrecht. I mean, he played a little bit, but it, it's more leadership and veteran leadership. And I think that it shows you the value of having seniors and guys who, you know, can provide that leadership and and that you can trust on the floor uh, more than anything, more than playing ability, more than anything. It's it's just that veteran leadership that you don't see a whole lot of in college basketball anymore because of you know guys leaving early and things like that. So uh, I think it's I think it's interesting and it shows the value of having veterans. And and you know if you've watched the last two national champions. Villanova and North Carolina both had a lot of veterans on them, you know, and so while we've all become wrapped up in getting the hyped recruits and getting the, you know, five star one and done guys, and that's kind of become the culture. I think at the same time, you got to look and say, hey, you know what, it, it, there is a value to having veterans and having guys who know what they're doing on the floor and, and you know, can hit, can clearly handle pressure. And, and I think that uh, that's the value of those guys. And, and that's why you're seeing those grad transfers have an impact. So 
Let me ask you this, because I, I don't know if Archie's been asked about this. I think maybe he has about the grad transfer market and if he would look. And of course, he said, yes, I mean, they're going to look to every possible avenue. Um, question about Indiana potentially getting a grad transfer it would be because I believe the university itself actually makes it a little bit more challenging to get a guy in, although I don't know what those exact rules are. But I'm wondering just from a stylistic perspective, we know that teams like Indiana, like Virginia, that play a pack line style defense, you know, continuity, experience in the system, experience playing it together uh, is really, really important. Do you think at all that because of the system Indiana plays, it makes it at all more challenging to welcome in a grad transfer? Obviously, those guys would have the playing experience and more maturity. Does the system at all make that a bit more difficult of a transition for a guy than if he went elsewhere? No, I don't think so. I think that if 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 it was a whole team transitioning to a new system, that's hard. One guy can figure it out. And the other thing about a system like the pack line, it's just like running a zone or, or something like that. I mean, it's not similar to a zone, but I'm saying it's it's like running a specific system like a zone. The other guys can make up for it, you know, can, can kind of overcompensate until you're up to speed. So um, I do think that um, that it's, it's not as difficult as you'd think uh, to do that, to fit in. I think it's no different than fitting into an offensive system where you don't know anything. I mean, I, I think that it's, you know, it's all part of transferring anywhere, whether that's, uh, you know, that I, I realize a grad transfer has few, has less time to get acclimated before they play because they don't have to sit out a year. But I truly don't think it's an enormous issue uh, that's going to deter anyone from coming. If they want to come to Indiana to play for Archie Miller, they're going to do that knowing full well what they have, uh, you know, what what the issues are that yeah. they'll have to adapt to. Cool. All right. Well, I see that Andy Bottoms is here. So let's get on and get to the next segment. We're going to talk about the upcoming schedule, talk about what is possible if Indiana can close well, finish well down the stretch. That's coming up on the assembly call with Andy Bottoms. Stick with us. All right, perfect. Welcome, Andy. We're just on YouTube now, so you can you can talk. We're not recording for the radio. Hello to everybody watching live. Great to see you all. Yeah, sorry we started a minute late. It was like seven minutes late. Well, I, you know what? It's all right. <laughs> I meant a minute in the colloquial sense. <laughs> I'm gonna refill my water. You guys talk. All right, about I'm on. Me. I'm on the Skype call too, so should be all, should be. Yeah, all set. you're gonna have to get out and get back in. It's. Uh, uh, Andy Bottoms audio issues. You guys don't you guys don't typically see this because we do this off the air, but every time Andy logs in, we get real staticky audio. We're not sure why. And then he it's logs out peak, and logs back in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Peek behind the curtain that everybody is just gonna absolutely love hearing the bad audio of Andy Bottoms. Um yeah, anyway. Um, so we'll talk about we like I mentioned, we got some really great questions um that we're gonna hit in the final segment. I'm excited about what we'll be doing in the third segment because I found some really, really interesting statistics, some on Devante, uh, some on our defensive improvement that you are definitely going to want to hear. We'll get everybody's reaction on those. Uh Andy, let's hear now. All right. Is that any better? Perfect. Okay. Uh are you on Skype too? Uh I should be. Okay. Everything looks good there. So I think we're good to go whenever Ryan gets back. Um, do you want to hit us off with the bottoms line to start segment number two? Uh, no, nah, we can just get into stuff you got. Okay. So we'll talk schedule. Uh, did you see that note from Marcus Fuller that Coffee and McBrayer may both be out? Uh, I knew Coffee had been out, and I, 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 I feel like there was a third guy who took a really hard fall at the end of the game. Might have been Isaiah Washington, their last game. He kind of was like going up for a somewhat meaningless layup toward the end and the Nebraska guy like tried to block a shot and he like, he went down really hard. It was not one of those guys, but yeah, coffee, it seems like he's pretty, uh, he's pretty banged up. And then McBrayer's had leg injuries for a while. So they could be real thin. They don't really play he, like he's the guy who was, guys even in the last game. I feel like he made all those threes against us in the first game. Didn't he McBrayer? Um, if I recall. Yeah. Cause I don't think any of the, I mean, Mason had an okay game, but yeah, I think it would have had to be, I think it would have had to have been him. Um, okay. So so let's do this. Let's let start up, out. Uh, let me pull up your run sheet here. That would probably be a wise decision. Yeah, for this segment, I'll introduce the schedule we have coming up. Let's talk about what's reasonable, what we think they could actually do. And then we can get into the hypotheticals about you know uh, where that might place them in the Big Ten tournament. And then obviously with the overarching idea uh, you know, being, I mean, kind of what we think would be necessary to get an NIT berth. Um, obviously, I think to get an NCAA berth, they'd have to win the Big Ten tournament. 
and maybe win out. Yeah. But if you have any other thoughts, let's just let's kind of set the stakes for the rest of the season. You Did you guys identify be, which uh, Michigan transfer we're going to get? We we don't think there are any eligible. Yeah, Dang is it. Duncan is Duncan Robinson eligible? Because he's played three years at Michigan. His other year was at D three nah, Williams he, College. Yeah, he played someplace else. No, he can't. He can't. Does do that it. count? Does the D three? Does yeah. that count? Yes. Yeah. 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 So there's I don't, there's nobody yeah. eligible. So at least no one will get the advantage. Oh, shame. Yeah. Hmm. Disappointing. 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 At least nobody good. Well, at least nobody else is getting one. They that might have. I mean. I mean, they might have. Uh, I guess I only looked at guys who registered on Ken Palm. So if they have like a Priller type who yeah, doesn't, they gotta, doesn't register on Ken Palm, then maybe. Uh, they got one of those that I've never heard of. So that seems good. Brent Hibbets. Okay. Bring him on. So I assume he, might, him, be, he might be eligible. Get him, Archie. It's the key um, to success. All right, yeah. let's do this. Well, hey, if Beerline breaks some rules, maybe they'll just be able to directly transfer. Isn't okay. Beeline like renowned as being the cleanest coach in all of college basketball? Yeah, Which makes you suspicious. <laughs> I was just about <laughs> to say, you suspicious. always the ones you least expect. <laughs> That's right. What's his name? Jurich was lauded as being one of the greatest uh, athletic directors in the nation. And look how that turned out. Uh, this Hibbit, this Hibbits fella, you guys dismissed him so quickly. Uh, among his highlights from this year, this is actually listed as a highlight. Played in closing minutes against Shamanad at Maui Invitational. <laughs> just played. Actually, that's what most of these are. <laughs> Two of the four <laughs> highlights from this year are just played. Played in final three minutes against Alabama A&M. How many, post- how many trillions does he have? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. <laughs> someone, just posted just in the, on this. someone just posted in the chat, Romeo plus Hibbit. Sequels Big Ten Championship. <laughs> well, do we have two spots open next year or one? We have uh, one spot. Right. We'll make room for Hibbets, okay? Don't worry about the scholarship situation. Yeah. yeah. So we if just have one. Hibbets, right? Hibbets, Hibbets has a scholarship Hibbets, if he wants to. Hibbets wants to come. I mean, we'll make room. I believe as of right now, we have one. That's with nobody transferring and Juwan not going pro. <laughs> I believe that's I believe that's accurate as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, let's hop into this. Andy, Man, thank uh, you for the update on Hibbets. That was that was, that was a lot clutch. more that was a lot more Hibbets talk than I expected to get into. But uh, the, the I'm people really excited. who only watch YouTube are really somebody's going to contact better. him and be like, "Dude, somebody's actually talking about you on a radio show." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he didn't actually no. make it onto the radio show. Only the only oh, the YouTube mid segment banter off air. I mean, his off roommate air, okay. on on his roommate's podcast. They don't even talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Hibbets, man. <laughs> Where's all this hate coming from? Oh, wait. Yeah, that's right. We got Curtis Jones scholarship. So that's two. Oh, I thought that was the open. I thought that was the one. I think that is the open one, Jared. Mm. Because we were going to be over by one if we got Romeo. No, we weren't. I thought we were. Let's look at this. Now we got to figure this out. We got Jake Forrester. They weren't expecting him. And originally, they thought that if it was Darius and Romeo before we got Forrester... We'd be over by one. Then we got Forrester. We would have been over by two. Nah, Darius left. Um, no, I think I'm on, I'm on inside the hall. Yeah, I'm on inside the hall uh, too. That's where I go to answer I'm these wrong. questions. We got we maybe got I'm, two scholarships yeah. sitting open right now. It's like two. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, okay. we got two. Which All right, could I thought turn it was into three. Yeah. All right, that's good. So McBob can get his, and Romeo can get his, and we'll let's have wait till after know. the season on McBob. I love McBob, but let's wait till after the season. What do you mean? Wait. What else do you need to see? I really sold Ryan on Hibbets. I think that's probably the big hang up at this point. Does anybody else have video issues? Yes, I yeah, am. It just got it just kind of cut out for me. It did. All right, let's uh, test. Is it it's bumped a lot of a uh, lot of influx of viewers out of this? You guys are totally breaking up for me. Yeah, you guys are for me too. All right, let me let me um, exit. Come back. See if maybe Andy and I exit and come back. We can. Yeah, that's because right, I exited once. once I, I will not exit again. It was totally fine during the first segment. It was. <laughs> can you hear me okay, Jared? Uh, no? uh, yeah, I can hear you fine. But I also don't know if that's coming through on Skype or coming through on YouTube. Oh, yeah, that's a fair question. Test, test, one, two, three. Because I'm not... Something's weird here. It's, it doesn't look like it's registering my audio on YouTube. Mm. Let me see. Are you guys hearing all this nonsense? Yeah, so I'm saying amen in the chat. Be able right. to give I'm back. Insight into that. I know. I'm back. Um, boy, this window is really messing up for me. All right, Brian says he can hear everyone. Okay. Um, maybe strange. 
All right, may, I'll, let me let me try to get out and get back in. Okay, Maybe that's the issue. All right, I, th- I can do that, right? Even though I started it, I think yeah. so. You've well, done. Let's find out. Can you see? <laughs> video? It'll be a disaster if not, but it'll be funny. All right, well, let's give it a shot. Um, yeah, let me. I'm just asking if they can see the video. He said we can. They can see us all too. Okay, it oh. might. All right, be so I'll get out. I'll get out and get back us. in. Yeah. Yeah, let me get out and get back in. All right. Uh, Ryan, any thoughts on Coach K's uh, defense this year as they've given up 72 points with nine minutes left in the game? Uh, It's stellar as usual. <clears throat> so funny he has that reputation like every year they're like duke oh my gosh you know and you know coach k teaches that hard man-to-man defense it's like no he doesn't <laughs> like like where has he when has he ever done that if anything <laughs> laud, laud the fact that they shoot threes well that's that's what they always do they don't play hard man-to-man defense they never have i mean Badier, yeah, yeah. Great well, they're, playing, they're great. playing zone now so yeah clearly great they're man-to-man even, defense not even trying uh, Battier uh, was a Joel great. Beard, would you like to dribble to the free throw line to get a wide open jump shot? <laughs> Have at sure, it. Why not? <laughs> um. Okay. I can hear you better now, Jared. All right, cool. I think. Uh, okay, I think we're back. I don't know what the issue was there. Hopefully, that doesn't happen on a uh, post game show. Well, let's hope not. Let's hope not. All oh, right. come on. Like, like technical difficulties are, a, are a, we're strangers to those. Hey, you know what? We haven't had many technical difficulties this season. So knock, knock on some wood, wood, please. Would you knock on some? Please, come on. That, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. All right. This, yeah, this window is still acting funny for me. But if everybody else says they can hear, then we're fine. Let's just do it. I can, I can deal with it on this end. All right. Okay. Are we good to go? Uh, yeah. I forgot okay. what we said we were going to talk about first now that we got into that. You know what? Just let Jared go. Between the hibbits and the audio difficulties, it really, really throws you if you're not paying, if you're not careful. Yeah, it's honestly, it's all Jared that's breaking up. I think Andy's fine. And Jared yeah, just video is like computer. weird. It was like yeah, a, Jared, do you, are you running anything else on your computer? No, I'm not running anything that I'm not normally running, but something's definitely messed up. Is it not you? Or is it like a hologram of you right now? Are we in some kind of weird... You no, I don't, need to restart, yeah, I don't know. You need to restart your computer, dude, because it is all yeah. you gutting out. Yeah, the, yeah, your, it's got a video is like really like kind of flashing and. Yeah. All right. Let me let me start over. We'll have to restart the Skype call too. But just okay. stay here so the hangout doesn't close. I think, close. If, I think yeah. if we stay on the Skype call, I think you can just get back into it. Yeah. All right. Just entertain everybody. Yeah. 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 All right. And hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, oh, what's everybody? Oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one, Ryan. I did want to ask you about this. So this okay. is a, this is a perfect example. Did I hear correctly that Warren G's son is uh, signed to play football at USC? He is. Of he anyone I know, you would know. So. Yes, absolutely is. He's got, Warren G uh, will be regulating on and the sidelines of USC next year. Uh, he is the number twenty eight player in the nation according to the twenty four seven composite. A five star cornerback, Elijah Griffin. Uh, obviously his uncle is Dr. Dre who has a school named after him on the campus of USC. So really some family connection there. The Andre young and Jimmy Iovine school of like music production or something. Um, oh, yeah, wow. this is that's a lot more than I bargained for. That's that beats by Dre money, man. Uh, yes. so yeah, no, nice. he's apparently a really good young cornerback who went to mission Viejo high school. So he Sweet. committed to USC. He was looking, I think Alabama and Tennessee and USC. Nice. Um, and used to be committed to UCLA, which makes it even better. Oh boy, <laughs> cross town, cross yeah. town guy. And no, uh, I heard that on. I thought I was listening to the Solid Verbal today, and they had somebody on like breaking down recruiting rankings, and that came up, and I was like, wait, wait, what? So I, I knew that you were the person that I could go to to confirm this information, or Google, but you were my preferred. Yeah, I mean, come on, hey, Google, Google would give you the boring answer. Uh, I would have never learned about that Dr. Dre school. <laughs> well, it, you know what the best part about his announcement was, is that, that he announced, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and it wasn't like this it, he was part of the announcement or anything, but he was just hanging out with Snoop Dogg, was just hanging out there. Like, no, <laughs> I I mean, be. <laughs> and then Willie McGinnis, too, former USC great. Willie McGinnis was, uh, wow. 
was there. So it was kind of a star studded announcement, but it wasn't the funniest part about the Snoop Dogg thing is it wasn't there. He wasn't there as part of the announcement. He was just hanging out, like supporting him, which was kind of funny. Huh. And nobody was like, hey, there's Snoop Dogg. Let's talk to him. They were just kind of like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a very like, like, I think it was 12th grade me would have been very excited about all those developments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what do you think? What did you think about the uh, the Ohio State Purdue game the other night? That was I could not believe they came back. I mean, the way that how place far was, down were they? I because I, I caught the end fourteen. I think it was fourteen with around ten minutes left, maybe nine minutes left. Um, yeah, they just kind of chipped away. Purdue didn't get into Haas quite as much and missed a bunch of shots down the stretch. But yeah, it was because Bates Diop was kind of Matthias bottled him up a, a good amount of the game. Um. Our buddy, uh, Galen Clavio, had a great tweet that is absolutely 100% correct, and it's that at some point in the tournament, Purdue is going to run into a group of officials who actually call fouls on Ethan, uh, or, uh, not Ethan Haas, uh, on, on, on Haas. Ethan Happ is who I was, but on Haas. A guy named Ethan Haas would never get called foul on him either, though, to be fair. No. Uh, is going to finally get called for his elbowing and shoving defenders around and all that stuff. Eventually they're going to do that and, and it's going to kill him. I mean, it really yeah. will. Yeah. I mean, the one, don't... the one part of the end of the game where he basically like just treated uh, Jalen Tate, like a, a blocking sled was, was a good one where that went uncalled. I, I mean, he, all, he also managed to get Weston called for one in the first half when he elbowed him in the neck. So Seems good. You elbow a guy in the neck, he gets called for the foul. It's a, at it's some a good deal. Point, at some point, he's going to um, have to um, get called yeah. for those, and it's going to it's going to kill him. I mean, it's going to. I do. I, I think that's true. I think in some cases, though, like people get away with a lot against him because he's so big, too. So in that's, some ways, that's, that's definitely true. But it, I, I think it was he, kind of on like Shaq where everybody would just, you know, manhandle him. And it was like, well, I've yeah. got to give this guy a chance to, to guard him. Because he's big, yeah. No, he, yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's definitely an element of yeah. You can't do some of the stuff that that he does. But no, anyway. I mean, no, yeah, Jared, you're right. Jared, you're completely right about this. Yeah. Chris Allen just got drilled in the on a drive. That was fun. Oh, I want to talk more about Ethan Haas myself. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. He sounds he sounds like a heck of a player. Be the worst. It'd be the fan favorite the for most sure. Hated, yeah, yeah, the most hated player in the <laughs> seven two and show, travels constantly. Uh, yeah, Never Haas travels. Perfect. Yeah, Haas travels his fair share too, but you know, I guess they give him leeway because he's so enormous that once he gets that body moving, like, you know, it's like it's like it's like trying to pause a continent from shifting. <laughs> All right, I All think right. with that you're back and you you sound and look pretty normal. So okay. you know, oh, good. That was that was strange. Hey, again, if that's gonna happen, better that it happens now. Are you uh, we, how's this? You have to watch the YouTube video back. Ryan and I talked about uh, Warren G's son. And, uh, committing to USC in football. And the Ohio State Purdue game. So, see, here's the thing. Uh, we covered you guys get funny, funny how we got into USC talk. I it's actually so, brought it. I actually brought it up. I, that's what I, I heard. You guys bring up things like the Padres and Trevor Hoffman, and, and then you get mad at me for talking about it. What do you expect? You should show some restraint. Is what you should do. It's a what should I just maturity. not respond to your questions? I can do that. <laughs> I, I don't think we, you can. we just like to get you going. <laughs> yeah, well, All right. It's more fun. You're not way. alone. Um, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's Sounds like we just waded into after dark territory a little too early here. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's do this. Segment two. Uh, did you check the Skype call? Is it working? Yeah. Test. Yeah. Let's do. Yeah. He's let's do it. a super quick test recording. Uh, yeah. One two three. Andy. Test. One two three. Test. 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 One two three. Andy, talk again, because you were really low. Low. Oh. Uh, all right. How is it now? Better? Worse? Angle the mic towards your face a little more. Do we need to get yeah. shove it in your? I'm really, really close to you right now. Okay, that was, that was better though. <laughs> I would just all like right. point it towards you a little more because it seems yeah. like it's kind of sideways. Well, my the stand is about if if you turn it, it's a it's a delicate balance because if you turn it the one way, then it just like spins That's all the way it. down. When you get up, when you get up, to, it's it's better there. Okay. Yeah. You're, you, okay. All right, we are good. Not right. here or here so much. But here, oh, here. <laughs> uh, see, this is what it would be like if Ryan were the shot doctor working with guys on their shot forms. 
Oh, there'd be tangents of like a half hour. Not, like, not here or here so here. much, but here. <laughs> here, well, here, not here, not here. Uh, okay. Um, here we go. Let's talk right. about the schedule. All right. Yeah, this thing's still live. Everything's good. Okay. <clears throat> here we go. And people watching on YouTube are troopers at this point. It's 940 and we're going to start really segment are. two. But they really are. You guys are awesome. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> You are listening to The Assembly Call. I am Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. And don't forget, if you ever have to miss all or part of an episode of Assembly Call Radio, there are two great ways to catch up. You can subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for Assembly Call. Or you can join our live Thursday night broadcast or watch the video replays by subscribing to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash assembly call. Definitely don't miss the video replay for this one, because if you go watch it, you'll get about a half hour of, uh, of nonsense right there as we dealt with some technical difficulties between segments. Uh, I think which it was I closer guess, to 15 minutes, but let's, you know, whatever. Really didn't need to admit it to the radio folks because they never would have known. But just in case you uh, stumble over to the YouTube and are like, what in the world is going on this episode? That was not normal, but hopefully it was fun and entertaining nonetheless. Uh, okay. Among the topics discussed were Warren G and a fictitious basketball player named Ethan Haas. So just to pique your interest a little bit more. <laughs> yes. The most hated uh, player in Big Ten history who never existed. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. I, Ivan Rinko was probably the most hated player in Big Ten history who never existed, but we'll give we'll give Ethan Haas number two. Uh, okay, so we teased talking about the up, upcoming schedule. So let's talk about it here. It, we know Indiana has a couple of, of games that you look at and you say these are very winnable games, games where Indiana is actually ranked higher than these teams in Ken Palm. Uh, you know, and that hasn't happened a lot this season, but Indiana's moving up, Minnesota, Illinois moving down. So you would look at those games as games that Indiana should be able to win. Then they have three games to close that include road games at Nebraska, road games at Iowa, and then a home battle against Ohio State. So I look at this, guys, and I think three and two is very reasonable uh, because I, you know, I feel like the way Indiana has been playing, I think they can and should beat Minnesota and Illinois. Uh, and then I think Indiana can win one of the final three. You know, the, obviously the one that you would kind of point at and say is most likely would be at Iowa. Uh, but you know, you also have Ohio State at home, and maybe you can get that. So four and one doesn't seem out of the question, but three and two kind of seems most reasonable. Like if I had to bet some money on it, that's what I would say. Andy, as you look ahead to this, what do you think is reasonable? And then we'll kind of project what that would mean for Big Ten tournament seedings, possible postseason play, all that. I mean, I think with the the trajectory of of how the team has played, and not necessarily the wins and losses, um, I, I think the three and two feels about right. I mean, that's kind of what we talked about. This team's been kind of a 500 team for the better part of the non-conference season and the conference season. So I think to project something in that range is probably the most reasonable. Although I do think, um, you know, to your point, a, a potential four and one is there. I think the at Nebraska game is going to be tough. They've got, you know, they really can't afford to slip up. They're still in the tournament conversation. Uh, obviously playing Ohio state at home as as Purdue learned last night is, is no uh, walk in the park either. So those would be difficult. I think the Iowa game on the road is a, is a big swing game in that regard. Um, and I think, you, you know, they played really well against Michigan State the other night, but I think could be a little bit of the how Rutgers played against Purdue uh, deal where it's easy for teams to get up for the, you know, the big guns in the conference to come into their place. Uh, and they played really well for the majority of that game, just kind of lost control a bit at the end. Um, so I think it could be a scenario like that where I'm not sure that there's quite the emotion and, and all those kinds of and quite the environment when IU would come to Iowa. So I think that's another uh, you know good opportunity. They win those. They win you know ride a four game winning streak into those last two. Who knows what might happen? But I, I think three and two is probably the most likely. Ryan, what are you expecting going into these final five games? You know I, I think that uh, four of those five are winnable games. I know Iowa and Nebraska on the road. Obviously, it's hard to win on the road in the Big Ten. But you know what, this team. <sighs> needs to be able to start winning some road games and start showing that it can win road games and and whether that's building towards next year or just showing growth for this year uh, that needs to happen and, and i think that iowa and nebraska very beatable teams um and it, when you the only thing that makes it more difficult is the iowa game starts really early in the day um it's an afternoon game which we all know Ugh. i'm not a huge fan of um two o'clock ryan doesn't like any game to start before five i think yeah no i mean legitimately i don't i think it's bad <laughs> for the it's bad for the players I, I think that you know anything that throws you off your normal rhythm is bad for the players that said it being a road game um 
you know, I'd say if that were the Nebraska game, it would favor Indiana because it favors the underdog usually. But I don't think I think Iowa and Indiana are, you know, I don't think there really will be an underdog in that game. I think people will just sort of assume that it'll be a close game. Um, so I would say that Iowa will probably have the advantage because they'll be more comfortable playing at home. But uh, yeah, I, I just don't like those games. So you never know how a team's going to come out if they come out flat or not. Um, but then, you know, the Ohio State game, that senior night will be there. It's a chance to finally get a big win. Um, Indiana's yeah. undefeated with us in attendance and it's at home. I mean, you got a lot going for you in that game. Yeah, and they've been so close. They've been close twice to beating, you know, big, big time Big Ten teams and and lost uh, against Purdue and Michigan State. So you got to think that they're going to pull off one of these. Um, I just feel like they will at some point this year, uh, but we'll see. I mean, Ohio State obviously a very good team, uh, and Indiana did not play particularly well at Ohio State. So we'll see uh, how they how they line up. Yeah, hopefully Indi- uh, Ohio State has a long memory for how that game started and they underestimate uh, Indiana <laughs> heading into that game. I think it'll be more of the same. So, Andy, again, I think we all kind of think that three and two is most likely. If Indiana does that, and check my math to make sure I'm correct, but I believe they would finish 16 and 14. They would be nine and nine in the conference. And you know, if we just kind of try and project some records forward, look at what a record typically gives you in the conference, that would place Indiana probably in the eight or nine range, somewhere in there. Uh, that would obviously put them in, in you know, kind of the eight nine game or the seven ten game, depending on how everything shakes out in the Big Ten tourney. So you'd most likely be playing someone like Northwestern, Penn State, or Maryland in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. I don't know that winning a game like that really moves the needle in a huge way for the NCAA tournament. It would certainly help for uh, potential, you know, getting into the NIT. But then if you can win that, you would end up playing Purdue, Ohio State or Michigan State, depending on how it all shakes out. Now, if by some chance Indiana is able to go four and one, they're 17, 13, 10 and eight in the conference. Now you can maybe get as high as sixth uh, and, and, you know, barring complete collapses by Nebraska um, and Michigan um, to jump over them. Uh, and then obviously that would you know change the Big Ten tournament seating a little bit. Um, but I think it's interesting to note last year Indiana was 18 and 15, seven and 11 in conference, and they were the three seed in the NIT. And obviously with these records, Indiana's conference record projects to be better. The overall record uh, probably won't be, and they won't have you know the weight of wins like that team had against Kansas and North Carolina. Um, but Andy, as you look at what those records would mean and where it would kind of place Indiana in the Big Ten tournament. What do you think Indiana would have to do to even get back on your radar screen for the NCAA tournament? Is it even possible and just shut it down right off right away if it's not? Uh, and, and is this something where we just need to start looking more toward the NIT and start looking at that kind of bracketology, um, barring you know Indiana playing on Sunday in the Big Ten tournament? I honestly think it's more the NIT. I mean, when you look down at who IU has actually beaten this year, if the tournament started today, they wouldn't have beaten a single team that would make it as an at-large. Um, you know, the Notre Dame, Notre Dame has had a ton of injuries and is kind of a shell now of what they were uh, at the time. And how you did beat them at full strength. So that's still to me the best win. But if you look down the rest of them, there, there just isn't a team that would really even be in the, in the mix. Um, so if you, if you win a bunch of games that, you know, the best chance that you can do to improve that down the stretch is to win at Nebraska and beat Ohio state and then, and then do more than that. So, um, I think they definitely probably have to win one of those games to really put themselves even in a decent NIT position. The other thing with the NIT that's a little bit weird is, um, and I and I like it to a certain extent, is that so if a, if a team in a non-major conference wins their regular season title, um, but they get knocked out of their conference tournament, they basically get an automatic bid to the NIT, which I think is cool. And those teams who have you know I like done it. that deserve that opportunity to do it. And it just depends how many upsets you have during. Um, you know, during conference championship week. And so some years there's a lot and some years there's not very many. And so that has a big, you know, the, the swing in number of actual available NIT bids is very much based off of those kinds of, um, those kinds of things. So it's a little bit hard to, um, you know, to predict that to, to, to an extent, but I think they'd have to win it, you know, a couple, even to make the NIT, I think they got to beat a couple of teams who would actually be, you know, kind of, you know, top quality, uh, top quality type, which we just don't have right now. You're listening to the Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. So, Ryan, as you look down the stretch here, again, you know, we'll we'll kind of keep tracking this as as wins and losses happen and see, you know, what moves the needle. And and you know, obviously, we've got a member of our audience who does a lot of NIT bracketology, and he'll keep us updated on where Indiana is. At last check, Indiana still wasn't in that field and actually had some work to do to get onto the NIT bubble. So that gives you an idea of 
you know, where Indiana sits going into these final games, but what are the most important things that can happen? Obviously, making a tournament would be great. You get the extra practice. You know, it keeps your season going. What are you watching for, uh, you know, even more than the wins and losses to, to, to feel good about how Indiana closes out this season? Well, I just want to see the development. I mean, I mean, we saw some of it against Rutgers, as we talked about in the first segment. You just saw them playing better within the system on both ends of the floor. And and you know, when things aren't going well with shooting and you know other stuff, do you you know shooting particularly from the outside? Uh, what do you do to compensate for that? And the answer against Rutgers was step up defensively and and play better defensively and create offense from your defense and turnovers and and rebounding and things like that and get it up the floor. Um, yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see what does this team revert to if it's not shooting the lights out, if it's which it hasn't done all year. But uh, hey, you nine know, for twenty against Rutgers, it was. Yeah, a- but you know, what do they do, and, and how do they, um, you know, make things work when you know they're not at their best? Because that's the thing about college basketball and basketball in general. It's not just about winning when you're at your best and when you're pumped up and when you know you've got motivation it's easy to get motivated to play Michigan State or Purdue or a you know a top 10 team like Duke or whoever it's not easy to bring that every night and so you're not going to bring that every night so when you don't have that energy when you don't have that focus of you're locked in from the three point line you're locked in in your offense whatever what can you do and how do you you know compensate for that and you compensate for that by being solid in all the areas you can be solid in that is again hard play tough defense move the ball on offense um you know rebounding make your free throws which i have given up waiting for from this team um but i mean you know control the things you can control and and, and do the solid things and if you do those it's more than likely you're going to win regardless of how well you're playing uh, and how many of your shots are going in and how locked in you are if you do those other things the baseline is typically you'll at least be close in a game and then you just got to go finish it off so um you know i i think that that's what i want to see i want to see when you know you only score 65 points hold the other team to under 60 you know i mean can you do that can you you know make them play, make the opponents play the way you want them to, instead of being a slave to whatever they're doing. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for me is I want to see that continue. Um, we've seen a couple good performances, uh, in the last few games. Um, you know, particularly Michigan state and Rutgers. I thought those were great performances from this team. So let's continue to see them build on that. Andy piggybacking on that from an individual standpoint, and let's remove Devontae Green from this conversation because I think I think we'd all agree he is as important. His his progression through the end of this season into next season is just critically important for the team and the program. Outside of him, and obviously removing the seniors, who do you think is the most important player to really progress and kind of, you know, use these next five games to kind of take the next step and 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 not just help the team win this year, but kind of take the next step to getting ready for next season? Well, that eliminates a large, a large a number of, of people who would be. So, if you took away everybody, but no, um, I, I think to me, there's a of guys who are going to get realistic playing time. It would be one thing to say Clifton Moore because I think there's some some validity to that, but I, I just you know nothing we've seen so far suggests he's going to get enough playing time to do that. So, uh, I feel like it kind of has to be Justin Smith. Um, yeah, you know, we talked last week about trying to trying to get Zach McRoberts turn turn him into senior year Dane Fife, but I think that's probably something that maybe happens in the off season. Um, but I think, yeah, it kind of has to be Justin Smith. He's really, uh, you know, struggled a little bit in the Rutgers game. I thought, as we talked about after the game, just almost trying to do too much after, you know, not starting for these couple games. And he came in and had some drives that were a little bit out of control, just, I think, trying to make plays and, and make up for that. So uh, I think seeing him really get back to, you know, playing under control, rebounding the ball, um, doing the kinds of things they're asking Freddie McSwain to do right now, because, um, while Justin Smith, I think, can score and do that, if if you assume Juwan's back and, and all those kinds of things, I think Smith fits into a similar role as, as he's being asked to play this year. So if he can get a head start on, on really kind of settling into that, I think that would be a good thing for sure. All righty. Coming up on the Assembly Call, we debut this new segment called Did You Realize? And I've got some great stats that you're definitely going to want to hear, and I get the guy's reaction to those stats. That is all coming up here on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. Beautiful. Uh, we need to start keeping time here, don't we? <laughs> That's your job, man. I know. 
There's I'm all no discombobulated we. after the tech issues, man. There's there's no we about this. I'm, I'm out of I'm out of sync now. I'm like I came in, I missed my first few shots, I dribbled the ball off my knee, and now I got to get my head back in the game. Um, yeah, here we go. So you were pretty much this. This is your this is your Indiana State, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, basically. So I gotta I gotta recover before that before it turns into a disastrous loss that is it's now crazy. around my Duke, neck for the rest of the season. Andy, I mean, you follow this stuff. Duke basically plays five guys, right? Like the entire game. Yeah, they, they they playing some different guys right now. I don't know if it's because people fouled out or whatever, but yeah, I mean, they pretty much like they hardly use their bench, which you know they've got reasonably highly rated guys on the bench, but they don't use them. Yeah, they play Bagley, Carter. Ooh, that was Grayson. Sweet. Um, Duval and uh, and and Shaq of the Mac Jr. So yeah. they really don't play anybody else. Although they're playing Alex O'Connell now, who just hit a three. See, they should be playing more apparently. Shaq of the Mac, love it. Uh, that's a solid reference. That yeah, really is. That's, that's a, a solid game. reference. Also, they a actually, great the, nickname. like that I is was, one of the better nicknames in recent college basketball history. And it's I not even recent, we loosely. We were in high school. <laughs> yeah, and we were we were giving Duke a hard time about Duke's <laughs> defense at one point, but then I said North Carolina had seventy two points with nine minutes left. They only scored ten the rest of the game, but they also missed some pretty wide open. Shot. Yeah, they did. They missed the one guy missed like three layups in the same possession. I think. So well, nobody punched good. Grayson Allen, so it was a failure to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, let's hop into segment three. So we have 23 minutes and 43 seconds left. So we're good. All right. We all right, are good. Yes, let's. All right, here we go. You are listening to the Assembly Call. Go to assemblycall.com slash join right now or as soon as it is convenient to learn how to subscribe to our email newsletter. If you want to get more out of being an IU basketball fan, then you need to be on our newsletter list. You will get our weekly Six Banner Sunday news roundups as well as our post-game analysis emails that we send the morning after every game. It is all free and it will make you a smarter IU basketball fan. Again, the URL is assemblycall.com slash join. I am Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. And here's a new segment. It's called Did You Realize? Because as I was kind of prepping for the show and just prepping for the week, looking at some of the numbers as I do, some really, really jumped out to me. And so, you know, I, I kind of want to, and, and a few of these have circulated on Twitter, so you may have seen them, but they're worth hearing again and kind of allowing it to sink in, especially if you are someone, you know, in terms of these first numbers, who is wondering, you know, if there has really been progress and how good, you know, really is the progress and all that, especially on the defensive end. So if you recall, Indiana's adjusted defensive efficiency at Ken Palm earlier in the year was in the 200s. I mean, it was bad, and it didn't start out the season that bad. Obviously, last year's team wasn't very good, and we entered the season with a bad adjusted defensive efficiency, but it went down, down, down after so many poor performances, especially the Indiana State game and the Fort Wayne game, which were a real drag on it. It is now 76th, and you know, 76th, nothing necessarily to write home about, but that jump that Indiana has made midseason is truly remarkable. And if you look just over the last 10 games, and you can't actually do this at Ken Palm, but you can do it uh, at barttorvik.com. And he his numbers, I was actually uh, messaging with him earlier today just to find out what the differences are. And there are some subtle differences between his formulas and Ken Palm's, but they're they're basically the same, but you can they're similar. Uh, but you can get a little bit more granular with trends and different segments in the season. So here's something that I, I want to ask if you guys realize that Indiana has the seventh best adjusted defensive efficiency in the country over the past 10 games. Basically, Indiana would give up 89.7 points in 100 possessions. That is outstanding. Now, unfortunately, the offense is only 104th, uh, but that is essentially the same as what it has been all season long. All right. And despite the fact that Indiana's record is only five and five in the past 10 games, the Hoosiers actually have the 30th best efficiency margin over that span, which is how these sites rank teams. So basically, Indiana has been playing like an NCAA tournament team over the past month, driven by its defense, uh, you know, and obviously having two of its mammoth games against Purdue and Michigan State at home, uh, which has certainly helped. And just so you understand the comparison, the defensive efficiency through the Fort Wayne game was 210th, right? Overall, Indiana was 130th. So, and again, now Indiana, the seventh best adjusted efficiency over the past 10 games. So, Andy, number one, did you realize that? And number two, you know, how important 
is that? I mean, does it make that big a difference looking at these, you know, small samples within a season? To me, it certainly does because of what it says about how Indiana has improved from the beginning of the year, even the middle of the year to now. Oh, I mean, I definitely think it's meaningful. I mean, when you look at last year and what this team struggled with, I mean, defense was a constant drumbeat of of criticism and concern. And and that really has has turned around a lot. I mean, this year things obviously got off to a rocky start and you would see flashes, but it wouldn't be sustained. And I think they've started to do a better job of being able to sustain some of that, you know, defensive energy and, and things like that. And yeah, the sample size is kind of small, but it also contains four games against the best, you know, arguably, uh, I guess if you throw Duke in there, but, but certainly four of the toughest games that IU has, has had over the course of the season with you know, two against Michigan Duke State, in there. Purdue and, and Ohio State. So, you know, it's not like it's it's only games against cupcakes. There are obviously a couple in there that, you know, teams that have really struggled. And there's a couple, you know, probably outliers either way. The the, the first Michigan State game, um, probably on the negative side and the and the most recent Rutgers game, maybe on the other. But um, you figure those balance each other out though. Yeah, I mean, they, they yeah. do kind of yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And and so yeah, and even if you look just in the in conference on Ken Palm, I mean, I use third in defensive efficiency and in, in league play out of anybody. So obviously most those ten games all are are a function of that. Um, but you know, that's a, that's a huge step forward there. And so if you kind of looked at, you know, it's, it's like anything else, right? There were a number of problems that were on the team, you know, last year, and then, you know, you may not be able to address all of those at once, but, you know, Archie talked from the beginning about defense and that being a focus. And you can point to the fact that this was a focus, they acted on it and they showed tangible improvement. So uh, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to dismiss something like that. Yeah, and a clear counter is, but what about the shooting? And you're right. I mean, the shooting has been terrible. You know, we're kind of trying to 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 show where the progress has been. We all know how poor and putrid the shooting has been, and the improvements that need to be made there. But you know, Ryan, this is the reason why this is important to me. Is this is a program with an identity that is going to be built based on defense, and to see it come this far. The other thing is. Numbers are one thing and, you know, geeking out about the numbers and your third and adjusted defensive efficiency. I mean, we can pretty quickly put people to sleep talking about this. And I hope that I didn't with my explanation there. But the thing that really matters is the eye test matches what the numbers show. Like this team looks more connected. The rotations are more crisp. You're not seeing guys just be wide open for three pointers. You're seeing closeouts be better. You know, everything about the defense looks better. And so then when you look at the numbers and you say, oh, wow. I didn't realize the numbers were that good, but that actually does kind of match up with what I'm seeing. That to me is why, despite the record, despite maybe the lack of postseason play, all of that, I think if if, if you're not feeling encouraged about the direction the program is going, especially on the defensive end, I, I just think you're not looking hard enough. Yeah, I think you're missing it. I, I I really do. And and look, one thing we talked about before the year about Archie Miller teams is they play better at the end of the season than they do at the beginning. And and they get better, demonstrably better. And you're seeing this team get demonstrably better defensively. And and um, you know, I, I think that people need to recognize that. I know the results haven't been there. And as a fan, that's of course frustrating. But at the same time, there has been improvement. And and it's one of those things where it's so I mean, we talk about it after games, it seems, every week, but if they could just shoot a little better, they'd probably have five more wins. You know, if they could just... Not a have little s- better. Like, like, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, so, if they knock down three more outside shots in, like, five games, they'd have five more wins. You know what I mean? I mean, it's they're, they're not that far away from being at least... I mean, I'm not saying that makes them a, a national title contender, but it, it's a solid tournament team, probably. You know, it, like, solidly in the tournament, if you win five more of those games and look a little better. Um, but I, I think that it is indicative of the fact that they are playing better. They are playing smarter. Um, and, and and they are sort of more comfortable in the system, which is something we didn't see early in the year. We saw really bad closeouts on three-pointers. We saw guys missing rotations. I mean, now, as you said, those those rotations are crisp. Guys are covering for each other when they do rotate or they do double. Um, and so it's much, you know, it's 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 really encouraging to see. So I, I think that you have to feel positive about it. Now, of course, you want to win games. I get it. But you also have to adjust your expectations based on what we've seen from this roster. And and you reset your, your you know, expectations and, and what you're expecting and what equals success. And growth is success when you're looking at a program as opposed to just a team in a season you have to always be getting better as a program and and you know moving up the ranks and clearly they're doing that 
Yeah, and to be clear, there will come a point in the near future in Archie Miller's tenure where there is a standard that is set and it doesn't fluctuate from year to year. The reason why you adjust expectations this year is because it was very hard to set them coming into the year, not knowing how Archie would be would deal with the leftovers from the Tom Crean era, and it just looks like it took a little bit longer than maybe we thought. I think that's why we're a little bit more liberal with the resetting of expectations now. As we talked about at the end of the Tom Crean era, it's not something we want to keep doing on an annual basis because we're tired of it, you know, after doing it so much the last four or five years of the Crean era. So I just want to be clear about that. That's not something that will continue, but I think it's fair to do for this year, especially. I think I think everybody has to know that at this point. I mean, if you're an Indiana fan, there are it's not to the level it was during Tom Crean's first year, obviously. But you have different expectations this year than you'll have once Archie Miller has all his players in, once the system is in place. And, and Brian, once I, I'd like to introduce you to Twitter one of these Yeah, and trust me, I hear from them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you are listening to The Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. Let's go to the, the, the next part of this Did You Realize. So guys, did you realize how much better Devonte Green is against really, really good competition than he is in games against, you know, 150, 200 ranked teams uh, on Indiana's schedule. L listen to these numbers. These really, really surprised me. We've talked about this before, but I didn't realize how big the gulf was. So in 25 total games, Devonte's offensive rating is 91.1. His effective field goal percentage is 40.6. His assist rate is 19.7, and his turnover rate is 19.7. All very important offensive numbers uh, for a point guard, a guy expected to handle the ball a lot. Listen to this. In nine games against Tier A opponents, that's the best games on Indiana's schedule, Michigan State, Ohio State, Purdue, Notre Dame, Louisville, Michigan, Duke, Seton Hall, his offensive rating is 106.1. That's plus 15 over what it is overall in the season. His effective field goal percentage is 45.8. That's plus 5.2. His assist rate is 23.4. That's plus 3.7. And his turnover rate is 11.3, which is minus 8.4. So basically, that gulf between his assist rate and his turnover rate, which is even in normal games, goes to about 2-1 to one against better competition. And if you look for a comp, a recent Indiana comp for what Devontae does against Tier A competition, he's basically freshman year Yogi with fewer turnovers. Because Yogi's offensive rating was 105.3, his effective field goal percentage was 45.4, and his assist rate was 25.7 with turnover rate of 45.7. And for Devontae, when you add in Tier B games, and there's been about five of those, the numbers are still better. The difference isn't quite as pronounced, but the numbers are still better. And the trend was evident last year as well. His offensive rating was better in the bigger games than it was overall. Now, the plus side to this, obviously, is that Devontae clearly rises to the occasion in Indiana's biggest games, you know, maybe brings just a better level of focus, is more locked in. The downside, of course, is that neither of the next two games are Tier A or TB or, or Tier B uh, at home. So hopefully Devontae's strong play continues, but the final three are. So, Andy, when you hear stats like that and, and see that a guy really, really steps it up against the tougher, tougher competition but really struggles maybe in the games that, quote-unquote, don't matter as much or, or not as big a stage... What does that tell you about that guy? And what does that maybe suggest for his future? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, everybody's hypothesis would be the exact opposite. Um, you know, that, that you would, you know, struggle more in those bigger games. I think part of that is, is Devante's mindset. I mean, he's clearly a confident guy. You see that with him on the court and, and I think sometimes just takes those challenges on, um, you know, in a different way, it seems kind of, it, it does seem counterintuitive. I don't really have a better explanation than that other than just, you know, really kind of sharpens things up. And, and part of that is, you know, some of those games that you reference are among these last ones where he's played his best basketball of the season. So, you know, some of those where the Purdue game is one of the ones you mentioned in the tier A games, but he played four minutes, doesn't really have a whole, you know, a whole lot of chance to to do to do much there. I think it speaks a little bit more to, you know, his his growth over the course of the season and that he's played tons of minutes these last few. And, and I would I would be curious to know what percentage of his minutes, you know, in those tier A games came over these last few where he's played really well. Ryan, your thoughts? Are you, are you still I, I awake? Think, no, yeah, no, I was kind of dozing off there. Uh, numbers are not my thing. Um, no, I was, I, I was going to say that I think that um, with him, it might just be a lack of focus, you know. And a lot of guys, it's that thing where when you get up for the big game or you get up for the challenge, you psych yourself into, um, you know, 
playing better and you, and you psych yourself into having more adrenaline and playing at a higher level. And some guys don't deal with adrenaline well, and some guys really do. And, and clearly he is dealing with, you know, playing top level guys. The problem is, is I said this earlier, you have to bring that intensity every night. And when you don't have it, you got to figure out ways to, you know, maximize your ability when you're not super focused and you're not super, you know, locked in. Uh, because look, it, these are college kids. They're not going to be locked in every single game. There's fatigue. There's, you got to study for a test. You got your girlfriend broke up with you, whatever it is. There are going to be games where you're not super focused. Your mind is elsewhere. What's your default setting in those situations? It should be, okay, I'm going to play defense and I'm not going to turn the ball over. And I'm going to, you know, at least carry my weight on both ends of the floor if you're not going to have an intense, great game. And and that's, I think, the struggle is getting to getting this program to that point where your default setting is enough to beat the other team, you know, and, and, and it has to get there. You know, but it is encouraging from the fact that, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about Devontae and I know that he's been frustrating, but that kind of shows you what he's capable of. And the fact that he can do that and perform like that against some of the better competition you know, I think it shows you why it's worth really investing in this guy and seeing what he's got for the rest of the season and for the next couple of years, because I still think there's a really productive Big Ten player in there. Uh, and we're finally starting to see it over these last couple of games and hopefully it continues. All right. Coming up in our final segments, we've got some great questions from you all. Question about Zach McRoberts and who shoots a free throw if Indiana gets a technical foul or gets a technical free throw. We'll talk about that next. All right, that was 1434. A good uh, good quote from Archie tonight, apparently, about the defensive improvement. We went from probably a team that counted on about one and a half players in November and December. Like, you could count on those guys playing really hard. You knew you were going to get from an effort level standpoint. And now, I think we've emerged maybe at one time, four and a half on the floor at all times that are giving max effort. If you can get all five, oh, crap, just lost it. If you can get all five every single time out there playing as hard as they possibly can, that's when you have a team that's getting better. Good. Unfortunately, I didn't find that before you. Uh, before we had that discussion on the show, you can, well, you can pop in with this at the beginning yeah. of the segment if you want. Barely, to. Never what do we got in the fourth? We have. Let's see. We got eight minutes and thirty-five seconds for <laughs> this segment. Yeah, that's right. Um, so look at the questions that are in here. I want to ask the one about Zach McRoberts because I think that one's interesting. Um, uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think it seems pretty clear. I mean, I think he's so much more well suited to Archie's system because That's he's going to get I mean, he's going to get rewarded for the things he's good at. Don't you think? You got you guys handle that one. I I might. Uh, I just but hate questions you, about disagree? the pat. Well, it's not that I disagree, but Crean's the one who put him on the team, so he clearly liked him. Y you know, I mean, it's. That's why I think it's an interesting question, though. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have an answer, but you guys handle the majority of it. I, I just think that it's, you know, a lot of this, well, do you think Crean would have done this? Well, we don't friggin' know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that's my, that's like, that's, you know, it's like the, it's like the questions about who's going to transfer away. I, I just like, why speculate on that? I don't know. Mm. I, it's, it's, it's a completely valid question for you guys to answer. It's just that stuff like that. <laughs> oh, stuff like that okay. No, stuff like that irritates me though personally. So I get it. it. Like I get why you guys will answer it and do fine, but it irritates me. So oh, I'm gonna, my. Yeah. It's so good. Okay. So so good. I, it, you know what? It's worthy of you guys, not of my take. <laughs> looks, looks good on you though. Yeah. yeah. It looks, looks good on you though. <laughs> oh man, that's. Uh... Yeah, you answer, you, ask, you answer a question like that, you better get a free bowl of soup. That's good stuff. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to do these. We'll end with these. this awesome comment that we got on Twitter. <clears throat> um, and then the email about the guy whose two-year-old son loves Ryan. <laughs> I don't know. It's my target audience. I don't know. <laughs> Clearly, I'm hitting it out of the park. <laughs> target audience. People who don't know any better. Yeah. yeah. That seemed uh okay let's let's do this it's gonna be midnight before we finish this <sighs> longest assembly call radio recording ever whose fault was that well all of ours really i know i know it really was <laughs> <laughs> i was late andy was late jared's video screwed up yeah okay 
All right. Um, here we go. <clears throat> You are listening to The Assembly Call. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Brian Phillips wrapping up another week of Talking IU Basketball. Uh, it's that portion of the show where we answer your questions. we got a bunch of them. I don't know that we'll get to them all, but let's power through as many as we can get to. Scott uh, wonders aloud what everybody is wondering right now, guys. Who shoots a free throw for Indiana if the other team gets a technical? And I mean this. like Who who would you feel most confident in right now setting to the free throw line, especially if like the game were on the line? Which can they it, always seem to be with our free throws. Later. Can we have Archie shoot? Is there a little known rule? That <laughs> can our manager shoot? That's, I mean, is it anybody in the building or just on the floor? <laughs> it's I, yeah, um, I think it has to be an eligible player. Uh, I would well, say Devonte Green or Robert, or Robert Johnson. Um, but Rob hasn't been great lately, so I yeah, Devonte's percentage is surprised. That's another thing you may not realize. I mean, he's shooting seventy some percent from the free throw line. He's been, yeah, and he's and, and quite good. frankly, quite frankly, that should be better. But uh, I mean, if you're a guard, you shouldn't be below seventy five percent. So, so, so I, would, ask, I mean, Zach McRoberts would, would has a pretty good percentage. I said Newkirk, yeah, and whether he would be on the floor given some of the roster things now, but like he hit some big ones late in that Penn State game. That's true, he did. But not with the, co- but he looks so unconfident right now. I don't yeah, with how he's know. played recently. I mean, I would love to to put him there if he can shake the, you know, the yips that the he's yips. got kind mm-hmm. of yeah with all of his other shooting. Well, Jared, how do you think his confidence is going to feel when you don't trust him to go shoot free throws? So you're just making it worse. You're just throwing gasoline on the fire at this My point. My colleague, Mr. Bottoms, makes an excellent point. Yes. Um, okay, but well, now, the, what, what about McRoberts? Because he has a really high percentage, but hasn't taken many. Yeah, yeah he's like, he, what, 10 out of 14? Yeah, so his comfort level might not be. Yeah, no, I don't think he's the guy who takes it. I, th- I think that you've got, uh, it, it's going to be Robert. It's going to be Devontae. Um or Freddie, who went four for four in the Rutgers game. Of course, yeah. But he's shooting <laughs> roughly fifty percent on the season. Okay. <laughs> Freddie McSwain, fact- first guy, first guy I think for a free throw. Okay, but the fact that you could throw Freddie in there is a testament to Freddie bouncing back from the air ball against Michigan State and to how poorly the team overall is shooting free wasn't throws. This is this is where we are. Michigan State wasn't he yeah, It wasn't it wasn't good. Yeah, well, he had nine offensive rebounds, so he could have done literally anything. Yes, and <laughs> all anybody would have done is praise an amazing game. I still can't believe that happened. That's preposterous um okay here this is a question so i didn't want to do this question but ryan handpicked it and so we're going to do this one this is from parker <laughs> do you think that zach mcroberts would be having nearly the type of breakout season he is having if Crean was still coaching i don't think he would get his chance in that system <laughs> but with the new system where defense is actually practiced he has excelled really solid wording to that question like really not at all making it a mystery of what Parker thought about Tom Crean's defensive coaching there. <laughs> this is very much a, hey, please confirm my thoughts on this. <laughs> and I'm going to twist the knife a little bit as, as, <laughs> as we go. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, I think obviously the answer would, would seem to be yes. I mean, even if you just look at his, you know, minutes, you know, there were a couple games where he played a lot, um, you know, last year, but, but generally, you know, didn't get a whole lot of run. So, um, I think it's it seems reasonable. He's an Archie kind of guy, and when you you talk about all these quotes from Archie about guys who give effort and you know you can count on, I mean, he's a guy who we've put in that category pretty, uh, pretty quickly since the beginning of the season. So um, I think the answer is yes, but he also does things that weren't necessarily the things that that would float you to the top of what Tom Crean wanted to do, and and weren't necessarily a great fit within his system. So it's a little bit hard to say. Uh, as well, because I think the system, you know, the system wise, I don't know that he ever would have been able to have that breakout season if any coach came in and tried to run the system the way that it was before. By the way, awesome quote from Archie's radio show. The uh, Josh Margolis tweeted this, but the question was, how can you get the whole team to play as hard as Zach McRoberts? And Archie's response was, if I had that answer, we would be really good. Zach is an impressive, impressive kid. He's an impressive player. I told the guys the other day, I don't feel that there are three or four guys in the league that should be on the all defensive team over him compared to what he's been doing as been asked to do his hustle, his effort level, how he impacts the game. It's incredible. And he's just a good teammate too. And I mean, Andy, I agree with you. I just I think the things that he does uh, are more valued with the type of basketball that Archie Miller wants to play. You know, Tom Crean obviously brought him into the program, played him, you know, some significant minutes in games last year. I mean, let's not forget that he he played a lot in some games last year. Uh, but I don't think he would have risen to the spot where he's kind of the consensus second or third best player on the team right now. I don't think that would have happened uh, were it not for Archie Miller's system. And Ryan, we have to go to you on this, obviously. 
By the way, uh, no offense, Parker. I did not want to answer this question because I think it's it's so hypothetical. I mean, we don't know. Um, I would say that, yeah, of course, he fits he fits what Archie wants to do better. But then again, Tom Cream brought him. Uh, you know, but we kind of know. We saw him play under Cream. We saw him play under Archie. I mean, well, yeah, but saw... he also might just be better this year too. And and you know, he might be doing that. I mean, look, Tom Crean's a guy who gave a lot of minutes to Colin Hartman when people were questioning why Hartman was playing, and Hartman proved it. And a lot of the intangible things that Hartman does, Zach McRoberts does, you know, and so I think that it, it really, it, I mean, it depends. It really does. I mean, I, I don't know the the answer to the question. I think, yeah, you're right. He fits what Archie Miller's doing, um, but there's also a chance that with a bunch of guys not playing as well as they should be this year, he might have gotten a chance and might have shined in the same way. And, you know, maybe he would have been encouraged to shoot more in that system. And maybe his defense wouldn't have been as good because he would have focused more on his offensive development. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we don't know. But, um, you know, it's, you know, go ahead. Answer the question. That's... Well, we already answered it. So I know you did. <laughs> uh, OK, so this was an awesome comment that we got. Uh, this came in from Trent and I wanted to read it because I loved it. This came in on Twitter at the conclusion of the Purdue Ohio State game. I instinctively opened YouTube to listen to your show like Pavlov, like Pavlov's dog. As soon as the competitive college basketball game ends, I'm ready to hear you say, let's move the ball and find the open man. Um, and wow. obviously th this would be the point in a mailbag where Bill Simmons would say, yep, these are these are my readers. These are our listeners. Uh, we love that, Trent. That that was awesome. And then Darian came back and said assembly call expands to all Big Ten games. So, gentlemen, what do you think? Post game uh, show after all big Big Ten games. A you guys get rid of your kids. a hard pass on that one. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> you guys got to get rid of your kids. I'm probably gonna move to a better apartment for that. <laughs> yeah. um, Look, I'm not gonna get on. I'm not gonna get on and talk about and talk about 18 Rutgers games. I will not do it. I have okay. standards. But but for a fleeting moment, like the idea of doing it for maybe like big games, like for that game, it would be kind of fun. Like that yeah, would have been a fun he, game to hop on because that was a great basketball game. My salary is going to have to be a whole lot higher for that to happen, I think, Jared. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll work on Always that. negotiating, my friend. <laughs> we'll work on that. Uh, and then we had another email from a listener um, who let us know that he loves the show and that his two-year-old son loves Ryan when he puts us up on the big screen after the games. And I wasn't really sure how to respond to this. Um, it's but my target I, audience, clearly. <laughs> It's that and like dogs and cats. They all just love me. They as gather. I, as I said during the break, your target audience is people who don't know any better. So yeah, yeah. I guess the dogs and cats thing works pretty well. Hey, man, well. I'm, an, I'm an uncle of four kids under eight. I, I mean, I just, I know what I'm doing. It's, well, they don't have a choice. But yeah, to pay that's attention. true. You know, they so don't. That's, I, could so. see, I could see some of the, the older ladies in Southern Indiana really liking you because you can be no nonsense. And I think they like their sports talk, no nonsense. <laughs> We'll have to do a do a listener poll and and find out what they think. What is your age and what do you think of Ryan Phillips? <laughs> yep. No way that could go wrong. No, no way. <laughs> Not at all. Um, okay, Andy, real quick too. We've got 20 seconds. This is from Isaac. Had James Blackman Jr. stayed, would his shooting, yet lack of defensive presence, have led to more wins? We still wouldn't have had a true point guard, but would have had someone who can make shots. Ryan hates hypotheticals. You have 15 seconds to answer this one. <laughs> Boy, Thank that's you. tough. I find it a little bit. I find it a little bit hard to see with how he played defense at times that he would have earned a lot of playing time. But uh, uh, but there's a part of me that's like, man, we can really use the shooting. So okay, but seeing hurt. Archie's seeing Archie's body language like five times a game, when yeah, <laughs> James would make a defensive mistake. It, it would be hilarious. It's only good for two wins. It'd still be worth. It. <laughs> It's totally worth it. All right. Uh, that will do it for us on this week's episode of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. Or you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com slash join to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU hoops again with you next week. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the room. Go Hoosiers. And cut. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to text right. you to something that Kyle Coster, my coworker, got sent in an email that I don't want to talk about online that is hysterical. Okay. We are live right now. Well, I know, but I'm not going to describe it. It's... Controversial subject, but uh, his response was beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. Okay.
to an right, internet right. commenter. We'll say that. I look, I look forward to it. Okay. We apologize for teasing something that Sorry, you guys. get to see. <laughs> That's not how we typically like to do business here, but <laughs> uh, I just sent it to you both via text. <laughs> okay, so we can at least react live. Oh, yes, boy. like we react. can read this and people can get our live reactions. All right, so this yeah, don't be... read it out loud. I appreciate the trust that you just put in us. Yep. I mean, you can read it out loud, but I think it might upset some of our audience. <laughs> I like Ooh. that the first part is that he didn't even get the guy's last name correct. That's always that's always a good start. <laughs> Chad Chad's calling just, a party foul on you, Ryan. Just so you know, I didn't care enough to spell your name correctly. I did care enough to write you this angry email, but not enough to to get your name well, right. No, yeah. and, and then read the very end, and then read Kyle's response. That's my. Yeah. All right, hang on. I I didn't get. Read, past I mean, the, read the whole thing, but yeah, Kyle's response is the best. The uh, email I got I just did, said, I Jared, skip. stop reading so many advanced metrics during the show. I don't know what Andy yeah. got. Yeah. All right, well. Did you read it? <clears throat> no, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> read it on the air. <laughs> You'll like it, Jared. All right, fine. Uh, okay. I'll just watch Washington beat Boston here. <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> All right, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I just love it. one line response. That, that is perfect. good. <laughs> that is that is a great response. Uh, All right. Uh, All right. It lived up. It lived up to the to the billing. <laughs> um, somebody wrote and, a okay. Let me let me. I can I can summarize without okay. getting into the subject matter, yeah. guys. Somebody wrote a very impassioned. <laughs> Uh, cutting email to my coworker, just like with this really like deep, like you know, it's it's a couple paragraphs, and it's it's just very like angry at him for something he said, something he wrote, and Kyle's response was, "You spelled your own name wrong." <laughs> That's <laughs> the entire I did spell his own name wrong in the email. He, yeah. he he misspelled both his own name and the email of Ryan's coworker, and, and the, the name guy, of Ryan's coworker. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the last name of yeah. So, so yeah, clearly, uh, he doesn't sweat the details. No, no. <sighs> All right. Um. Hey, what time's the game Friday? Four thirty. Thirty. Yeah, East uh, what, Pacific. Yeah, four thirty Pacific. We're both correct. And okay. six thirty for you, Jared. So six thirty Central. We've time. got we've okay. got it all covered. Are we all? Yeah. So I might be able to do a halftime report for that one. We'll have to see what the bedtime situation is. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, I can do it. There's no problem with Not it. My I'm, bedtime, I, by the way, my daughter's yeah. bedtime. Be I'll be good. To be clear, uh, yeah, thank I'm gonna probably have the. Uh, I, and it drives me nuts, but I'll probably have the opening ceremonies in the background in case anything major happens, like a stage collapses or anything. Wow. You know, like, so, well, I'm just saying, like something. Yeah. I, that's the first thing I could think of, which probably says a lot about me. But uh, it, the, <laughs> you know, something crazy happening, I I may have to jump off and 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 write about it but i don't think so i mean i, I hope i just hope the two-year-olds aren't watching right now i hope mm. because that oh this is after dark scary. if you have a two-year-old and they're watching this is something called after dark as soon as we're <laughs> yeah, done <it's> just... <laughs> with the regular show it's, it's true <laughs> maybe you're 17 doubling down on irresponsibility <laughs> at the point when you're letting them watch ryan at 10 30 i mean come on oh anyway all right we need, we need to do a reenactment of the old charles barkley commercial with ryan saying he's not a role model Oh dear! All right. Okay. Uh, you guys all done? You guys yeah. done over there? We're done here. Uh, I think we're done. Uh, okay. We'll talk to you guys Friday after right. IU Minnesota. Later, guys. See y'all. All right. See you guys.